Good morning, everyone. Uh, after two long days in the, this fourth conference on statistics and data science, we are now back for the third day. This will be our last day, but we still have a lot of activities. We'll start with an invite paper session with three speakers. Then we have a keynote speaker, the closing ceremony. But the in the afternoon, we have two short courses, one by David Banks on data science and another one by Paulo uh, Ferreira da Silva. So don't lose the, the, the program of today. So I'm very pleased to have to, to organize this invite paper session. This, it was organized together with Lisandra, the chair of the local organizing committee. And we have here um, three speakers that will tell us a little bit about, uh, about machine learning and statistical learning. Um, the first speaker uh, will do as follows. I, I will, I will uh, give the word to each of them separately. And then we have a few minutes for questions, if there are some. And then we move to the next one. And in the end, we, we will be all together and we, we close this uh, invite paper session. Okay. So our first speaker will be Rafael. Rafael is big. Rafael is a, a, an assistant professor at the Department of Statistics of the Federal University of São Carlos here in Brazil. He obtained his PhD in mathematics and in the Department of Statistics and Data Science at the Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. Prior to that, he graduated and received a master's degree program at the University of São Paulo. He is a CNPq research fellow. This is a, a, a uh, and a kind of, of award that, that our, one of our uh, funding agencies in Brazil gives to the best researchers and is interested in theory, methodology, applications and foundations of statistics and machine learning. Uh, Rafael, it is a great pleasure for us to have you here today with us. Um, we, we are very much looking forward to hear your, your, your talk and what you have to share with us. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And now the so, floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Paulo and Lisandra, uh, for the invitation to be here and for the kind introduction. Um, so today, uh, can you see my slides already? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, they, so today I'm going to talk a bit about uncertainty quantification in machine learning. Uh, I'm not going to give a general overview, but I'm going to talk a bit about the methods I've been developing over the last uh, few years. Uh, so uh, over the last maybe 10 or 20 years, there were many revolutions inside machine learning in terms of the accuracy that their classifiers uh, can achieve. So the last revolution I think was that deep learning and nowadays, if you have an image, it's pretty, uh, the classifiers for images are pretty accurate, at least these types of images. Uh, and that, that was not true 20 years ago. So there was really a revolution. Uh, uh, methods became much better now. But one issue is that uh, in many problems, it's not uh, the input of a, of a machine learning method does not necessarily uh, determine its output. So this is X, this is Y, and X doesn't necessarily uniquely define Y. So just one example for fun, I think most of you have seen this, 
the question here is, is whether this is a dog or a mop. And some of them are pretty easy. So of course this is a dog and of course this is a mop. But there are some cases which you don't know. There's not enough information in the image for you to know whether it's a dog or a mop. And I, again, this is of course just like an example for fun, but this is the case in most real applications. So let me get let, let me give you another example here. So I like this example because there's only one X, one covariate, one feature. Uh, so it's easy to see. Um, each dot is a country. On the X axis, we have the GDP per capita of that country. On the Y axis, we have the life expectancy. And the goal here is to create a prediction method for life expectancy given uh, GDP per capita. So this is your Y and this is your X. Um, if you use a standard supervised learning method like a neural network, random forest, or even a linear regression, you're going to get a curve. You're, going to, you're basically feeding a curve here that predicts Y as a function of X. So if a country has a GDP per capita of 75K, you're probably going to predict it has a life expectancy of 81 years old. Um, and if you look at the spread around this value here, 81, in this neighborhood, um, it seems that your method is pretty accurate. There's a small dispersion here. On the other hand, if you get another uh, value for X and you want, there's another country you want to predict its life expectancy and it has a GDP per capita of 5K, uh, your method is probably going to output something like 72. But if you look at the spread, the spread is much larger than it was here. And that ref reflects that, and, and, and that's, uh, that shows you that you have more uncertainty about the life expectancy of this country than of this other country. So uh, not only the same X doesn't give you the same Y, you can have two countries that have the same GDP per capita, but different life expectancy, but also different Xs can uh, lead you to different uncertainties about their predictions. And in my, many applications, in many, many real applications, it's very useful to quantify this uncertainty. So it's not enough to uh, and the, your problem uh, and your application with just a point prediction. You want to know how accurate it is, but in in a local um, um, in a local sense, okay. And there are, and the question I want to answer here or show two ways at least in which you can try to answer is how to describe the uncertainty about why you have. So you, you don't want only to give a point prediction. You also want to measure the uncertainty you have about uh, the output. Um, and again, as I said, there are many, many methods that, that became a very popular um, uh, research topic in the last maybe five years, or maybe a bit more. And I want to give you two solutions, uh, some of which I've, I've worked on. So uh, one of the ways of quantifying the uncertainty about why, uh, given the x, so x is the input of the, of the, in, of the instance, you want to classify it, the covariates, of a new sample point, and you want to measure the uncertainty about y. One way is to assess the conditional density of y given x. So this is a true distribution of y given x. So y is a random variable, and it has a distribution given x. Okay. As I said, x doesn't usually doesn't necessarily um, uh, define y. So this dis distribution is not degenerate. It's not a point mass at some value. It's, it's you have a, a, an uncertainty about y given x. And one way is to try to me measure. Of course, you don't know this density. You need to estimate it. But one way is to try to estimate this conditional density. Uh, uh, what most supervised learning methods try to do, at least if you're using a square loss, which is the standard thing, uh, is to get the mean of this distribution. So this is a distribution as a function of y for a given x. And what deep neural networks, random forests, and all of these methods are trying to do is to get the expectation, the expected value of y given x, which is a function of this. So this has more information that, than just the expectation. And with this conditional density, you can do many things like prediction intervals, you can compute quantiles and many other things. Okay? So this, in a sense, measures the, two, the, the full uncertainty you have about y given x. So just to give an example, this problem actually came to me uh, of estimated condition densities when I was in my PhD because uh, Astronomers, they want to predict how far a galaxy is from us, given the image of that galaxy. Um, and they know that if they could assess, they call it PZ, that's f of y given uh, x, so z is the distance of a galaxy. 
And these are two different galaxies. If you could measure this distribution, this is y given x for one galaxy, this is y given x for the other galaxy, you would see that it's usually uh, asymmetric, multimodal, and very complicated. And they have theory to explain why this, this, this is expected to happen. And because of this, they know that just getting the mean of these distributions, which, as I said, is what supervised me methods are trying to do, is not enough. You lose a lot of information. And they need to know these distances to estimate cosmological parameters. And, and you know, there were many papers there from maybe 2010 or even before that that showed that if you knew how to compute this conditional density, or if you had good estimates of this conditional density, you could make cosmological inferences with a much better precision. But there were no good methods of estimating these conditional densities. And they created many interesting uh, uh, methods. And we, that's why I started to work on this, on this field. So uh, the question is how to estimate these conditional densities. And during my PhD, I developed one estimator. But after, after it, I, I thought about another one, which is my favorite one. So I'll, I'll just describe it in a nutshell here. Uh, but for details, you can see the paper. The, the goal, so this estimator is called FlexCode. It stands for Flexible Conditional Density Estimator. And in a nutshell, what it does is to convert the problem of estimating the conditional density, which is a, a function of both y and x, uh, 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 into the problem of estimating different regression functions. So regression functions, as I said, are conditional expectations, which is what supervised uh, learning methods are great at doing. So what it does is basically to, 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 to transform the problem of estimating a conditional density uh, into the problem of estimating the coefficients of a Fourier expansion. So this is a basis expansion, phi i are Fourier coefficients. And, it, and, and you can show that the, the coefficients of this, expect, of this expansion are regression functions. They are not the regressions of y on x. They are reg the regression of, a tr of different transformations of y given x. And so we, we use supervised learning methods to estimate these coefficients. And once we have an estimate of these coefficients, these are known functions, these are just signs and cosines, you can plug them in here to get an estimate of the condition length. So using this method, you can use random forests, neural networks, boosting to estimate conditional density functions. That, that's what this paper is about. We have code in Python and, and in R for, for doing flex code. And just to give a sense of the kind of things we can do, uh, this is, an ex this is, a, this is a, a, a toy example I, I created just to show, just to illustrate the method. So basically, I collected tweets uh, that had, uh, that, well, I collected tweets in English in this case, and I was trying to predict where the tweet was posted. So latitude and longitude. So there are two Ys here. And again, rather than giving a point prediction for y, uh, I'm trying to estimate the full uncertainty. So the full distribution, the full condition density. So because there are two y's in this case, uh, we have a two-dimensional distribution for each x. So x is the content of the tweet, the text here, the string. And uh, so there are two tweets, two condition densities that were estimated. And the condition densities, I'm displaying them as heat maps because they are three-dimensional, right? Um, and so there is this tweet, just pitching date on a, a, a beach boardwalk, and it nails down that it was posted here on this location. And the black dot shows where it was really posted and it was right. Okay. Now, the second as example, I think, is more interesting because uh, it, it tells you, the, the, the estimate tells you that it could have been posted here or here. And apparently, that's because there are two uh, long, beach, long beach islands in the US or something like that. And so it doesn't know where it was posted. And I like this example because in this example, if you were to, uh, to give a point prediction for latitude and longitude, at least those based on vanilla uh, supervised learning methods, it would output something here uh, in the middle of the US. That's because that's the center of mass of this distribution. That's the expected value of y given x if this condition that is well estimated. Uh, so it would, it, it would give a prediction that has nothing to do with where it was posted. And that's because when you have multimodality, the center of mass is usually not informative. Okay? It can be very far from the modes. Uh, so that, that was just a toy example. Now a more serious application here. 
to astronomy, to the problem I described of estimating conditional lenses. So this is this is a paper by the uh, LSST uh, uh, Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So so there is like this uh, telescope that is going to be released is released in Chile, and there are many uh, and well there are many research groups that are trying to anticipate the problems the telescope is going to face when it starts to uh, analyze the data, to receive the data and, anal and analyze it. And one, one of the problems is this problem of estimating conditional densities in the context, in the context, in the context of, 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 of the distance of a galaxy. And they did here a contest, sort of a contest, where they, try, where they applied many uh, methods to estimate these distributions and compare them to see which one could do better. And our method is here, FlexiBoost. It's a version of FlexCode that is tail tailored for this problem. There are many subtleties here that are a bit different. And uh, it turns out that it was the best performing metric, method according to this metric. So this metric is kind of the analogous of the mean squared error, but for condition lenses. And the smaller it is, the better the method is. So it, you can sort the methods by, their, uh, uh, by how well they perform. And our method was the best one. So I was very happy with this, with these results. Uh, now, okay, so I told you, that doesn't, I don't know. Okay, so I told you about how to estimate, so one way of quantifying uncertainties, which is estimating conditional lenses, and I showed you one method you can use to estimate these this uncertainties, which is FlexCode. Uh, it's a method to estimate the conditional lenses. There are many other methods to estimate conditional lenses. Uh, when we published FlexCode, there were not many, actually. But in the last three, four years, there was a revolution. And now, now, of course, people are using deep neural networks to do that. And there are many good ideas of how to estimate these conditional densities. But then one question you have is, OK, you fitted many methods. So you, you, you have a list of conditional of conditional density estimators with the loss functions. You estimated the performance. And you can tell which one is the best one, at least according to this metric. Now there's the question of, OK, but how do I know the estimates uh, The estimates are reliable enough? How can I tell whether this, this estimator is giving an estimate that I can trust in? And how can I know whether it can do better or not? Should I keep looking for better estimators? Should I collect more data to try to get something better? Loss functions that by themselves can't tell you that. And I think that's a place in machine learning that doesn't uh, that, that, that hasn't received a lot of attention. People usually use loss functions to sort their methods, get the best one, but there's not, uh, they, they, don't, they don't have ways usually of assessing whether the estimate is good enough or if you can improve it. And actually that's a place where statisticians have many methods, goodness of fit. I think that's very important and it's, it's a way you can bring together machine learning and statistics. All right, so uh, what we did next was to develop some tools to try to assess whether a condition test estimator is good enough or if you should keep looking for better estimators. Okay, so there are two papers here where we we try to uh, we try to address this question. Uh, so this one is published in UAI, this was published in UAI last year, and this one is under review now. Um, and I'm I'm not going to get, give you the full solution. Again, you can look at the papers if you want to see details. But just to give some some intuition, just to give some intuition of what happens. So there is a way people use uh, to to assess conditional distributions, and that's basically computing pit values. So pit values are probability integral. It's the probability integral transformation. It's the it's an area under the curve. It, it turns out that if the conditional density distribution is well estimated, it's uniform. It's a statistics you, comp you compute, and if the conditional density estimator is well as if your condition density is well estimated, it's uniform. And then you can do a QQ plot like we do in statistics to see if it's uniform. Okay. And this is what's done here for the various estimators that were used in this paper. Uh, this estimator is the best one according to this goodness of fit technique. Uh, because the pit value, uh, so 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 the basically the QQ plot is close to the line y equals x. But it turns out that this estimator is pretty bad. This is a, an estimator in which, which you basically throw away all your covariates and you, 
you estimate the conditional density of y given x as the marginal distribution of y. You basically pretend there are no covariates here, and you just estimate the marginal distribution. And it passes the test. And, and so this is really misleading, because it seems that this estimator is good, but actually it has no information, almost no information, because it's not using your covariates. Indeed, in terms of loss function, this estimator is pretty bad. It's the worst one. Okay, So we have to be very careful with, with goodness of fit. And in particular, the goodness of fit that is, is usually used for condition that is not good enough because there are bad estimators which can, which can pass the test. And that was noted in this paper. So they say here that PIT and other CDF-based metrics can be gamed by a trivial estimator. And so you know that, that, that's a, a real problem. And so we develop a better method that, can, that, that is kind of similar to, to this PIT uh, framework. But instead of having a single QQ plot, you have a local QQ plot. So for each x, each input x, you have a different QQ plot. And first, this is we can show this is consistent. It's a consistent method. So the only method that is going to pass the test is the one that has a perfect QQ plot for all of, of, of the local uh, uh, points. So for all the input points. Uh, so it's consistent, locally consistent. And uh, it gives you insights of for each regions of your feature space, your method is well estimated. And for each regions of the feature space, your method can be improved. So, so there is a lot of information here. And by using this information, you can show that you can really improve your method and uh, when you can improve your method and how you can improve your method. So in this example, it shows you, I won't go into the details again, but it shows for each types of galaxies, you can improve your method and for which ones your estimates are good enough. Okay. Uh, now, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, OK, so again, let me give a, a quick summary. One way of measuring uncertainty is to estimate the full conditional densities. But of course, if you want this conditional, if, if you want these uncertainties to be reliable, you need these conditional densities to be well estimated. So we have here diagnostic tools uh, 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 to assess whether the, the estimates are reliable enough or if you can improve them. Now I'm going to sh show you a second framework in which you can do um, for you can uh, in which you, which you can use to assess uncertainties, which is called conformal predictions. Uh, conformal predictions is a math is a framework from early 2000s. Uh, I think the first reference is this book, the the learning uh, algorithm algorithmic learning in a random world from Vlad, Vlad, uh, Vladimir Vladimir Wolf. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very smart trick. Uh, I'm going to describe how it works in practice, but the appealing property, so what conformal prediction is going to do is not to give you the distribution of y given x. Instead, it's going to create uh, prediction sets. So you're going to say something like, okay, the GDP of the, of the, the, the life expectancy of this country lives, uh, lies between 80 and 85. The life expectancy of this other country lies between 60 and 75. We're going to give prediction sets, okay? It's not going to give you the full uncertainty. But what's appealing about this method it is that it has the property that the probability that your y is in the set, your prediction set, is at least 1 minus alpha, alpha you fixed beforehand, even if the regression method is not uh, estimating well the true regression function. So again, regression methods, like uh, supervised learning methods, are estimating conditional expectations. Maybe they are doing this well, maybe they are not. And the appealing property of this method is that the prediction sets you obtain have the right coverage, even if the regression method is not well estimated. And the way it works, so I'm going to give one example here, is that basically you you you, you uh, split your data set into training and testing, and you get a, you, and you 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 save part of the data set for calibration. Okay, so there's a holdout set. You fit your regression method to the training and tested data. You can do all the tuning you want. So R hat is the met, uh, is the function you get from your neural network or your random forest, and then you compute the residuals. So true y's minus uh, estimated y's on this uh, holdout set. 
So you compute the residuals on all the uh, holdout points. And then you sort uh, these residuals from smallest to highest. And then, so, so okay, you compute the residuals. That's what I'm showing you here. And then what you do is to get the residual number n1 minus alpha. Okay, so this is the 90% if alpha is, is 10% uh, residual in this uh, list, in this sorted list. Then the prediction set you give is just prediction, the prediction for the new x, so the output from the random forest, plus minus the, this residual you computed using the calibration data. So that, that's the whole thing. It's pretty, pretty easy. And it turns out that this method you can show it's pretty easy to show that it has the right coverage, even if our hat is not well estimated. Uh, so example, a toy example again, y, x, uh, the dots are the data. I fit a neural network, uh, a neural, I fit a nearest neighbors here. This is the blow curve. So this is the, the code to fit the nearest neighbors in R. And all I'm doing, all conformal inference is just computing uh, these residuals. So this is, these are the residuals and then I get the quantile, in this case, number 95% of the sorted residuals, okay? Uh, and I do, Point prediction plus minus this value. That's that's the whole thing, and you can show this has the, the right coverage. <clears throat> so it's it's really really appealing. Uh, so this was uh, 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 this is the standard conformal prediction. It's more general than that. Uh, it took some years for for this framework to take off, but in but I think it was in two thousand. 16 probably that, that it started to take off. And there were many, many papers that started to work on this. I mean, 2018, I think. Uh, and we started to work on this as well. And what we proposed was to use a different residual instead of this residual. Um, so there are many residuals people use. It, it turns out that the framework is very general. You can use any residual here. Okay, it doesn't need to be this. And you can use, so this, these are the papers that have some of these ideas. Uh, uh, you can use different residuals to compute, uh, to, 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 to try to measure the uncertainty about y given x in different ways. So what we did on, on one of those papers was to measure the residual use, or, 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 yeah, uh, using the estimated conditional density of y given x. Okay, so these are the estimated conditional densities, you, which, which you can obtain using, for instance, Flexco. Uh, and what we do is to measure let's say the true y value is here so we measure how well this estimate is using the shaded area here and by using these residuals we can get prediction sets which are much uh more general than those that are obtained by using the method i showed in the last slides so in the last slides you can only obtain prediction uh, uh, prediction regions which are have always the same width across x okay so they are almost elastic. And by using our method, you can get prediction regions like this, which are heterostatistic, or, or even prediction regions that are uh, unions of intervals. They don't have to be intervals. They can be unions of intervals. I'm almost done here. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that we apply this to, to, to this, the, 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 these residuals. So these are our methods, the, the one in red and the one in yellow. We applied it to the problem of estimating the distance of a galaxy uh, using its image. Okay. And you can, and what we see here is that for faint galaxies, you can clearly see that you benefit from having these prediction regions, which are unions of intervals, which are expected because, as we saw, the conditional distributions are multimodal, at least uh, for these cases here. And the other methods they give very wide regions, or sometimes they miss a lot uh, the true values of the distances. Okay, so we can get more accurate, smaller uh, regions which have the right precision, which have the right coverage even if the estimated density, even if the density is not well estimated. That's the key thing about conformal prediction. It's robust in the sense that it gives you good results, well, correct results, even if, if the conditional density is not well estimated, okay? So just to conclude here, I showed you uh, one estimator of the conditional density, which is one way of assessing the full uncertainty. Metrics, uh, and uh, you can use, you, that I, I told you that you can use metrics to, to sort different estimators. But these are not good enough. So you need to. So we show. I showed you that you can use goodness of fit to test whether the method, which is best according to the metrics, is to is good enough, or if you should keep looking for better methods. And then I showed you an alternative framework, 
which is based on conformal inference, which can give you robust results because they're valid even if the method here is not well estimated. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I, 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 will, I will make a, a suggestion so that we, we have the discussion in the end, so, so that we keep, we keep the track on time. So uh, thank you, Rafael, for, for your talk. In, in the end, I, I'll, I'll put the, 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 the speakers in the, in the session and then we can have a, a short discussion, okay? Thank, thank you. you very much. Now I'm going to, to present the second invite speaker of this session is Luciano Revosas. Luciano holds a PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the Institute of Systems and Robotics from the University of Coimbra in Portugal, in Portugal, a master degree in mechatronics and a bachelor's degree in computer sciences from the Federal University of Bahia. He is an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science at the Institute of Computing at Federal University of, of Bahia and the head of the Inter Intelligent Vision Research Lab. He is a specialist in the field of computer vision and machine learning while his applied research focuses mainly on robotics, smart cities, biometric systems, and biomedicine. Luciano, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to, to share a little bit of your work with us. Um, it is a great pleasure for us to, to have you here today with us. Uh, please, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Paulo. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and. Uh conference is always well organized every year for you and uh, congratulations uh, so uh, my my speech here is about my perspective about uh, active learning so that uh, when I when I talk about this uh, active learning uh, I think about the images instead of all only only data only text data but uh, now Gonna talk, we're going to discuss about some perspective about active learning applied in images. Uh, uh, although uh, all the concepts of active learning can be applied for all kinds of data. So uh, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to say some few words about my uh, laboratory. Uh, so on the on the right side we can see some pictures of our facilities. Uh, on the bottom of the, the slide you can see the, all the social medias that we participate and broadcasts our uh, research investigate, investigators. Um, here we have uh, our website, uh, which you can find uh, in the ivisionlab.ufuba.br. Uh, there you can see all our all 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 information about our project publications and thesis that uh, were already uh, be defended uh, in in this whole ten years of uh, existence of the iVision Lab, uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, we we have we we work with uh, four four types of uh, fields. Uh, which we applied in the image pattern, pattern recognition and the computer vision, which are smart cities, biometric systems, biomedicine, and the robotics. So, uh, uh, talking about active learning, uh, have to pass uh, through a discussion about uh, passive learning. So, when you talk about active learning, we have to come up with uh, uh, the opposite, uh, the contrast um, subject, which is the passive learning. So passive learning uh, in the field of supervised, I met that all the audience are very familiar about supervised machine learning. So we have here in the slides uh, a, a kind of pipeline, a common pipeline that are used, that is used uh, to explain uh, supervised machine learning. So uh, here in, in the left side, you have uh, unlabeled data, uh, raw data. So we have a bunch of images in 
our case uh, that we have to label. Uh, if you work with the classification, you have to uh, just give a simple a simple label. And uh, if you have uh, if you are working with segmentation, you have to label each picture uh, each pixel in the picture um, so that uh, we we have to have a specialist to label all of these images. If you if you talk about uh, common pictures and uh, very simple pictures as you are uh, you are seeing in the slides, uh, it's very easy for any of us to label these pictures. But if you are talking about uh, a more complex and uh, a more uh, specialized image as those one that you are working in the medical field, for example, uh, we are supposed to ask a very, a very specialist human and to label all these images. And uh, if you have uh, a million of them, probably you're gonna you're gonna take uh, so many hours to label all these images. Uh, after labeling all these images we have uh, the data set label annotated so that uh, we can uh, we can train our supervised machine learning uh, to uh, to achieve a machine learning model on the BAM uh, decision function so here we have this decision function so uh, we can realize that uh, we have a big problem here it's uh, to uh, uh, to call a lot of specialists to to label all these images and they spend a lot of hours to do that. So uh, we have since we have this big problem, we can solve this problem with the uh, the method called active learning. Uh, the active learning is uh, is used to label. Uh, a data set when the amount of data is huge, uh, when it's difficult uh, to find many specialists to label the data. And the aim and the goal to the, uh, of the active learning is to label the data in a smart way. So we have here <coughs> a, a very good picture depicting the process of active learning. Uh, so uh, first, you know, we have uh, a small portion of your data uh, already labeled for his specialists, so so that the specialists uh, didn't didn't spend a lot of time to uh, to to label all these these images. Then uh, we have in the other side millions of images or million millions of data uh, to to be labeled because these data are unlabeled, uh, and then the uh, the the very, the very big important things in the active learning is to select queries, uh, to select uh, a very discriminant, discriminative uh, samples of these data set to, to to be used in the in the training of the classifier. So in the middle of this process, we have the oracle. Uh, for example, the human annotator, annotate, uh, which is uh, constantly uh, receiving uh, those label data, uh, which are labeled for a machine learning model uh, in, in the select query, uh, to label these data and uh, to give it to the oracle, the human annotator, to to decide if these data are uh, well annotated or uh, badly annotated. So uh, why don't randomly choose images? Uh, for example, we have here uh, a bunch of uh, data and we have two features, feature one and feature two, uh, so that we can plot this data in a, in a, in a chart, in a, in a plan figure in a plan uh, so that uh, if we train uh, a considerable number of, uh, of images or of data to train our classifier, uh, we, 
we can uh, uh, split the, those images into two classes. One class is represented by the red red dot, and the other classes are is represented by the purple dot. And we have a decision boundary splitting uh, those two classes into two 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 groups. Uh, we can see that uh, this is a linear decision boundary. So uh, it's, uh, if we have a considerable number of data, we can we can drain a bunch of uh, classifiers to uh, to solve this problem easily. Uh, but if we have uh, millions of uh, images, we can uh, smartly choose some of these data to uh, for the annotator label these data and then submit to the the machine learning model to be trained with these these uh, images uh, and then we have uh, almost the same uh, result as if we use the uh, all these all the data available uh, but now uh, the the effort was uh, 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 very small. Uh, cons consider if we if we had to annotate all these images, and so uh, if we do in a very smart way, we can have a very good result comparable to uh, the one as uh, if we uh, annotate all the data. So uh, to uh, to have the summary of the steps uh, to use a, an active learning method, uh, first we manually label a very small subsample of this data uh, available in the in our uh, data set. Uh, train the model on that subsample. So we have to to uh, at least annotate and train the model in those steps. But uh, uh, not expecting that the results of these classifiers will be will be so good as if we had annotated all the the data available in the data set. So the training model is used to predict the class of each remaining unlabeled data point. But this data point is uh, chosen by the selected query that we're going to see uh, further when I will explain some methods to uh, to the to query uh, the sample uh, to be used in the training of the classifier. Uh, and uh, the last step is uh, once the best approach has been chosen to prioritize the labeling, the process can be iteratively repeated. So uh, we we have to have to be in a loop uh, so that uh, uh, we are constantly evaluating the the score of the classifier and uh, trying to to see if the loss is converging and uh, uh, for the, the minimal value that you are stipulated so uh, we have some prioritization prioritization strategies uh, like community based strategies large margin based strategies and for steady probability based strategies as we have a short time here uh, to discuss all these uh, these methods for prioritization, uh, we just pick the posterior probability based strategy to explain in a more detailed way. So uh, the posterior probability based strategy, uh, in, in the posterior probability based strategy, we have, for example, three methods. Uh, uh, least confidence, margin sampling, and entropy. Uh, the the very first goal of all these methods is, is to achieve the samples that shows the highest uncertainty, because uh, if the data is uh, shows this this uncertainty, probably uh, this data will uh, will help the, the the machine learning method to discriminate. A little bit more uh, uh, the, the classes. So the, in the first in the first example, we have, uh, for example, four data, four data samples, uh, x1 to x4, and we have uh, three classes. Uh, the first method is the least confidence. So uh, where the p theta and 
the, the white hat, the white hat is uh, considered the highest uh, posterior probability. And the, if you take the complementary value of the, uh, the, the posterior probability, we're going to have the highest uncertainty uh, value in the, in the data set. So uh, here we have this data uh, and we have uh, above, uh, sorry, uh, below uh, each one of these classes, we have uh, uh, the, the score of the classifier that we already trained in the small subsample of the data set. So uh, the very first step is that uh, we, we're going to take uh, the one which is which shows the highest posterior probability uh, among the three classes. So uh, uh, considering the X1, we have uh, 0 0.9 as you uh, as you as you see in the slide. Uh, the in the in the second in the second data x2 we have 0 0.87 uh, in the third x3 we have uh, 0 0.5 and the, in the fourth the, uh, x4 we have 0 0.99 then we're gonna sort uh, in in the in a descendant order so that we, we're gonna have uh, x3 uh, I'm sorry, the, in the opposite way, in the ascendant order, uh, we have uh, the X3, uh, X2, X1, and X4. So that uh, uh, the higher uncertain sample uh, in, uh, is going to increase the model dis uh, the discriminability uh, at, uh, at the end. Uh, the other method is the margin assembly. Uh, in the margin assembly, uh, you're going to take uh, the highest and the second highest for posterior probability. And uh, you're going to take the difference between the two, uh, considering, uh, for example, x1, we have x1 0 0.83, x2 0 0.86, x3 0 0.2, and x4 0 0.98. So that uh, you're gonna sort at the uh, uh, ascendant order uh, and keep the uncertainty as the priority, but now in a different way. Uh, and the last method is the entropy, uh, where you're gonna use uh, our entropy to decide the uh, most uncertainty uh, value in an our data set. Uh, and then we have to consider that uh, we're not going to take all the, the data available in the data set, but uh, a small amount that you are constantly um, passing through the Oracle to decide, uh, after all, uh, if you take this and uh, retrain the classifier, uh, <coughs> the, the goal is uh, to keep always the loss function uh, having the uh, the small the smallest value. Uh, so <clears throat> here uh, to finish my my talk, uh, uh, I'm gonna show our uh, last uh, research uh, work, uh, which we call human loop. Here we didn't use an active learning, but uh, we we just take all the, the, the images available in the data set. So uh, uh, when you use the active learning, we have to, to think about billions of images. But you, if you have just thousands of images, as in the case of this, this study, uh, for example, we used uh, 4,000 images to, uh, to be labeled. Uh, human the loop is, more, is uh, the most efficient way to, to do that. So we initially annotated, annotated uh, 450 images and uh, finally annotated 4,000. And then we saved uh, 309 hours uh, to complete the annotations using uh, three experts to annotate. Uh, I hope uh, I, uh, you, you understand all the, the concepts.
concept behind the the active learning and then if you have some questions i i'm here to, to answer thank you very much luciano for the very nice talk uh, you were right on time um I, I understand that you 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 will have to leave now uh, at ten. You cannot be to, in the end to the discussion. So uh, my suggestion is that in in the chat that there are no specific questions. So, but but uh, uh, in the book of abstracts and in the website you can find the contact of Luciano. So if anyone would like to discuss or to ask any question, that I'm sure that you will be happy to answer them. So I, I think we will um, we will move forward. And Lucien, thank you very much again for for your availability and for being here with us today. Thank you, Paulo. See you thank next you. Time. Thank you. So now we are we are moving on to the to the third speaker of this invite paper session. The third speaker is Anderson Ara. Anderson is uh, in, he did his uh, BSc and master degrees in the at the Federal University of São Carlos in Brazil, and he did his PhD in statistics through the graduate program in statistics and graduate studies in computer science, uh, both in in the Federal University of São Carlos. Is currently the, a lecturer in the specialization in data science and big data in the Federal University of Paraná, also in the, the MBA in financial analytics, and in the uh, uh, also in the uh, in the Federal University, Technical Federal University of Paraná, and also in the specialization of uh, data science and big data at Federal University of Bahia. Since August 2021. He is assistant professor at the Department of Statistics of the Federal University of Paraná in the, the south part of Brazil. He was, before that, he was my colleague in, my, in the Department of Statistics at Federal University of Bahia. He also uh, um, has experience in teaching in the Senai, in São Paulo, São Carlos, um, and some other institutions. His, his research areas include statistical, statistical and machine learning, statistical inference, computational methods, and big data analytics. Anderson, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be here in this session. Uh, I think we will, uh, in this session, we, we, have, we have different directions. Uh, we have uh, someone from, from computer science, so Luciano is from computer sciences, uh, Rafael and yourself, you are more on the on the on the on statistical side. So I, I think this will make a kind of uh, nice overview on some of the fields in machine learning or statistical learning, depending on how you would like to call it. Anderson, we are very honored with your presence, and now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. It's a great pleasure to be here again. And uh, my presentation is a uh, applied. Uh, the presentation and we connected the machine learning methods with uh, a problem to predict the COVID-19 using x-rays, that uh, checks just x-rays. In general, we will propose a new method called the uh, convolutional support vector models. So uh, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. The outline of my presentation, I will be some introduction and about the methods. The proposed model, convolutional SVM, uh, show a simulation study and uh, the application, and we'll find we find considerations. So, uh, COVID-19 is an ongoing pandemic, and uh, in this on December 2022, we have in Brazil more than 35 million cases, and the world, uh, biggest number. Uh, 600, more than 600 cases. And it's very important to infected patients to be a great method to great difficult to high the lists, to timely finish the diagnostics. So it's very important to propose methods to predict it some, some fast. So the driving solutions in general is applied in many, many many kinds of problems in medical problems. For example, we had a, a headache, dementia, 
uh, breast cancer and heart disease diagnosis, for example. And uh, it's very important to be a fast and accurate diagnosis using, for example, images uh, also speaked by the, the last presenters. Uh, so the convolutional neural, neural network then is the most famous uh, tool in machine learning to using in medical images. So it's very, very uh, applied in many cases and images. So we have the, the uh, short problem about the, the terminology. Uh, machine learning, deep learning, we are living a data age, but a, a terms age also. And in this case, we will apply the youngest machine learning method proposing in less in the 90s uh, with by Vapnik and the, the co-authors. Uh, SVM, in fact, has many advantages. Uh, the method is rooted in theory, in statistical learning, the new new theory about uh, machine learning, in fact, proposed by Vapnik. And SVMs have, in general, superior generalization capacity. And uh, the global idea solution is based on a convex optimization problem is a great uh, advantage because uh, neural, net, neural networks, for example, has a problem in local, local uh, optimization problem in general. And SVMs use the kernel trick. It's a very important feature in, in support of vector machines. It's very convenient to solve nonlinear problems. And a very interesting uh, advantage only one part of observations and uh, examples or, or uh, the data, in fact, in, uh, is involved in the, the solution in general. Some parts, some part of observations in, are involved in the solution of the, the, the method. Also, SVM is seated in, in the red paper, what are the most important statistical ideas of the past 15 years uh, of Gilman and Vettari in 2021. And uh, the methods were seated in over parameterized models and regularizations. In fact, uh, support vector machine is very near a logistic uh, regression with a, a kernelized logistic regression with some regularization. And we, in statistics, we have many kinds of regularization, also lasso and reach, but uh, SVM can be seen as a kind of method with their proper regularization. And it's very important, uh, this method and others methods as Hanoforce, for example, are essentially no parametrical models. So machine learning, in fact, are no parametrical statistical models in general. And some papers uh, have showed that uh, SVM in, in general can be uh, overlaps the traditional CN, CNN approach in, in MAGE, for, for example. So we, in this presentation, it's applied, uh, it's applied paper in general when we using the, the images as observations. So here is a, a kind of example when we have an image and the matrix, if each element measures the, the quantity of, for example, uh, red, red or, or, or black in each pixel in general. For example, this picture has no black uh, color and he is quantity in a, a zero. So each image can be seen as a matrix and uh, many methods uh, work on, on this as speaker for Rafael and Luciano. And CNN in general, we have the input image, some convolutional phase, and CNN, convolutional neural networks, a pooling phase is a kind of uh, summarize the convolutional phase, and after that, a, classic, a classifier in general. The, the most common classifier is multilayer perceptron, and uh, the main idea of this presentation is change the multilayer perception by a support vector machine model in the last phase. So we can handle with the, uh, the images some feature extraction phase and the final, uh, the method, the method of classification. 
the convolutional process in, in general can be a, a transformation of the, the quantities of the images by a matrix transformation, can you see by this image, and uh, summarize as a convolutional, convoluted feature, in, in fact. So in the pooling phase is a kind of summarization of this, this, this image. For example, we can apply a max pooling phase with two by two features. And uh, each square here, we, we return the maximum value in each square, for example, six, and for example, here, eight. That is the pooling phase. And the flattering phase, in general, we had the pooled featured map, and now uh, ordering the or flattening the, the data in one column or one, one line. And now this, this kind of data uh, are the, the feature, in fact, applied in the classifier. So the, we applied here a support vector machine. The main idea of support vector machine is separated uh, the data points by a hyperplane, for example. And uh, many hyperplanes can be applied here to separate it well these points. So for example, this case or this case and the last one. Uh, intuitively, we have the, the, the situation in the this hyperplane is optimal to separate this, this kind of points. So the support vector machine is a great idea with some algebra and, and modeling to separate it well and obtain the optimal hyperplane to separate these points. And it's based on some margins and these data points are called support, support vectors. Okay, and we have two margins here and this are the supporter vector we have four supporter vector here and the upper plane it's based on the the distance between the the, the margins so the hyper plane is the center of the the, the margins also the support vector machine has the kernel trick and the the main idea is transformations uh, uh implicit transformation of the data when we he, uh, here we have the 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 data original data space and one feature map uh, function to spread the data in the the new new uh, on the new space with more with a greater dimension in general here we have uh, r2 2 r3 for example this is a kind of example of polynomial uh, kernel in fact so we have many kernels applied in this case, for example, linear kernel, it's the base, it's based as a linear support vector machine, polynomial kernel, and Gaussian kernel, for example. And this main idea can be summarized in some algebra based on an optimization problem. And here is the primal form, and here the dual form uh, based on uh, Lagrange multipliers, in, in fact. So these we have the convolutional uh, model. We transformation the input convolutional phase, add pooling phase and other convolution and other pooling phase. It's a, a kind of uh, modeling to apply the a classification method in, in final. So in this paper, we can some transformations, one phase of convolutional, one phase of pooling in general. And after the flating phase, we applied the convolutional support vector model with some kernels and compared it with a traditional approach, convolutional neural networks, one kind with this, this number of nodes and the other kind with, with, uh, with this number of nodes, all uh, the both with three, three layers, in fact. And this, we have a, a kind of deep learning in general with this, this number of nodes. And uh, the second multilayer perceptron is a new kind of the, the, the node. So we have so many parameters to be estimated in, the, in this kind of multilayer perceptron in deep learning terminology. And we applied the support vector machine in three kernel times. <clears throat> the procedures, in fact, we, we proposed a, a hold, holdout validation, 90, 10, right, with uh, 100 
uh, repetitions, some measures to verify the accuracy. We applied in this case the Keras with R and Kernel packages and the, the standard uh, hardware. So we performed the simulation stood with images. It's a very interesting uh, way to do this. We generated the two classes uh, with three uh, channel, red, green, and blue, and uh, with two different setups. Uh, one, the class one and class two is are separated by one standard deviation. In fact, we, we generated in the, in the normal distribution with uh, the class one has this mean and the class two has this mean, one, one uh, standard deviation. And the others, the others values is maintained uh, uh, the same. And the second setup with three standard deviations and only the green channel is, is separated, the class one and class two with three standard deviation. A kind of example of this, the, this image is by, by this figure. When the setup one is shown in the first line, and setup two is, is shown in the second line. So here we have a, a one, the standard deviation separation, and here in mean, in three standard deviation separation uh, by mean in green channel. So here we have the, the results, and we can see the CNN and convolutional support vector machine is very similar, but the, in this case, Convolutional support vector machine is more fast in general than uh, CNN, uh, in fact. And we have here these results for one standard deviation, and here three standard deviation when we see the most uh, predictive capacity with convolutional support vector models. And our applications, we have a real data with this, this link, it's Chinese uh, patients. Uh, collected on 4th April 2020, and uh, we mixed this data with health X-rays images uh, obtained by Open Access Biomedical Search Ringine. Here, a uh, kind of uh, description of this, this data: we have uh, almost uh, 1,500, 500 uh, patients with this this age and this gender. Uh, the method does not not consider this this feature as as in, in the model, it's just a descriptive student. Uh, we, the feature, in fact, is just based on X-rays. Here's an uh, example about X-rays and letter A and letter B uh, are two both pa patients with COVID, letter, letter C and D, other disease, and letter A and letter F, health patients. <laughs> we can see it's very, 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 difficult to to uh, not specialists to to see these images and and diagnose with uh, covid covid other disease and healthy patients very difficult to, uh, task in fact here we applied in in general this 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 modeling we have the the, the time performed by each method and uh, multiple perception traditionally uh, convolutional neural networks svm and convolutional support vector model, which has a, a, a great cap capacity compared to the other methods. And it's very interesting, the support vector machine uh, with convolutional features is very fast in the applications. Here is a, a kind of comparison of the, of the, the methods, a, a short, uh, a very simple kind of uh, measure uncertainty between uh, Two, two, two methods are among the, the, the methodologies when it's a matrix, win versus lose. In fact, the convolutional support vector machine with polynomial kernel is, is more, uh, have more predictive compa uh, capacity compared among the other, other methods. For example, a convolutional support vector machine with polynomial kernel is uh, eight, four times, uh, in the holdout repetition greater than support, uh, greater than convolutional neural networks one and two, for example. Here we have the, the comparison of the standard methodology support vector machine with the standard methodology uh, convolutional neural networks. In fact, the only support vector machine applied without the convolutional 
phase uh, lose uh, compared compared to the, the convolutional neural networks. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, result. And the time measuring seconds uh, by each each uh, repetition in, in holdout validation method and uh, all the support vector machine uh, has a, a many many uh, has a great time and uh, a lower time in computation in competition uh, comparison the the neural networks it's a uh, very interesting because uh, ne uh, neural networks it's performed by uh, uh, iteratively method uh, based on a uh, number of a number of uh, epochs, for example. So the final considerations in this paper, we applied the, the, the new method called convolutional support vector machines uh, with real patients with COVID-19 using X-rays. It's uh, compared with a standard of art in machine learning based on images. And uh, we have for future works, we can work with other kind of kernels functions and uh, uh, generalize the convolutional support vector machine. Uh, a comment in general, uh, support vector machine has difficult uh, in optimization phase for a large uh, sample size. And we have a, a, a team we working with this, this, the, this kind of problem. Uh, the paper published in the information uh, journal in 2020 and the some reference of the, the work. So thank you all for your attention. Here are my personal website and here my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anderson. Thanks for your nice presentation, for sharing some of, the, of your work with, with us today. So uh, we don't have, uh, we've not have yet uh, uh, questions in the chat. I will bring in Rafael. Rafael, can I bring you in? So, uh, since we don't have specific questions, uh, um, Lucien had to go uh, and they will not be able to be part of this discussion in the end. But I would like to, to give the floor to, to both of you to share any further words that you, you would like or uh, to, to say something about the, the other presentations and in which way you see relation because, because you, you, you spoke about uh, Although in the same in the same field, you spoke in very different directions. So maybe you, you would like to share a few words on for, for the, the, the colleagues that are not so much aware of uh, machine learning and statistical learning, because sometimes people say, well, I work with data science. What what does that mean? It's the same as saying, well, I work with statistics. That that's a very, very broad um, statement. So maybe you could say a few words to make some kind of possible connection on, on, on these mm. talks. Well, uh, maybe I have a, like a general comment. Uh, and and I, I think it fits well, like the, uh, the way this, uh, the way you set up who was going to talk here. And I, I think uh, the thing is like data science is very general, as you said. And one important thing is for statisticians at least is that there are many ways in which uh, statisticians can contribute. And I think both my talk and Anderson's talk show that because there's kind of a unique perspective because of the way uh, our education was, uh, uh, because of our education, uh, which courses we took and the perspective of, of, of how we see things. And I think, yeah, both of my and Anderson's talk are, are showed that. I, I want to just add some some comment about the the data science and machine learning. Machine learning is a is a a big tool in data science in general, and uh, uh, for statistical community is very important. We we can see that uh, machine learning, in fact, is is a statistical model. It's it's a kind of statistical model. It's not a a kind that uh, we the statistical community have. Uh, so appreciate so much in this kind of uh, no parametrical um, statistical modeling. There are several methodologies, and uh, data science is a is a, a natural connection between statistical and computer science, with some ideas and some uh, methods in in proceeding uh, the data. 
And uh, the, the most, the most uh, uh, important is machine learning is a kind of statistical modeling. Several I, 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 I listened for the, the others. Oh, machine learning, it's not statistics. It's very dangerous comment uh, in, in, in fact. And uh, I, have, I have listened to this in, in, many, in many statistical departments in Brazil, for example. It's very dangerous. And, uh, and it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the future, in, in fact, the, the, the major in statistics and applied mathematics and, and computer science to solve problems, in, in fact, is a, is a future. In general, statistics is, is the, the science that, uh, have, the, that have worked with data uh, in history, but uh, it's the time of statistics work with the other, other areas too to solve more problems and significant problems to real world. So I, I agree with the, 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 the Rafael, it's, uh, we have several methodologies and very, very different ways to, to work with data and work with data science or statistics and machine learning. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, I will close now this session. I would like to thank uh, Anderson, Rafael, and Luciano for taking a little bit of their uh, Saturday morning to be here with us. Probably not the best place to be in the Saturday morning, but uh, I, and because of that, I really thank you. After this, we will have uh, in 10 minutes at 10.30, we have the, the last keynote speaker. And uh, after that, in, at 11.30, we have the closing ceremony. And in the afternoon, we still have two short course, so don't lose what is what is to come. So thank you again, Anderson, Rafael. Thank you for thank you being here. Much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.